Uh, I want to take a second just to uh, welcome all of you to the Ovation Weekend at the Humana Festival of New American Plays, for those of you that are joining us here. Uh, my name is Zachary Microbuzzy. I'm the artistic manager here at Actors Theatre. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. And uh, we're really, really excited about this conversation that we're having here this morning uh, for Rise Up. Um, Actors Theatre is working uh, to become a more um, equitable place to work and, uh, and uh, an equitable uh, community here in Louisville. And uh, we're really excited for this conversation to um, uh, bring in some new partners in that work. Um, specifically, I'm excited to uh, introduce Judd Hendricks, who is the curator uh, and um, project manager of Lean Into Louisville, which is a new program out of the uh, Mayor Fisher's office uh, that's working to uh, create a more equitable city here in Louisville. So without further ado, I want to introduce him and he'll introduce our panel. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, uh, welcome. Um, you're in for a, a treat today. After uh, we've already had some really great uh, conversation just in hanging out this morning, so uh, you're in for a treat. Um, my name is Judd Hendricks. I uh, work with Lean Into Louisville, and uh, it is a uh, an effort to raise our collective awareness in Louisville around the historic and current discrimination against marginalized populations. Um, uh, the project was just launched a couple of months ago, and it's an effort to raise uh, our awareness around uh, groups that have been marginalized and experienced discrimination uh, historically and currently. And um, then what do we do about that? Once we raise our awareness, how can we take actions to uh, decrease some of the, the uh, discrepancies in, in health and education and income in Louisville? So um, those of you that are Louisvillians, um, welcome to that journey. And we hope uh, one of the things that um, and why we're supporting artists is that we believe that artists are the primary ones that, that raise our consciousness around issues. Um, artists have an ability to uh, speak truth to power. They have an ability to um, uh, name stories and tell stories that haven't been told. Um, whenever something is not being told in our, our communities, artists are the first ones to be able to give it voice. Um, and um, so we want to thank our, our, our panelists for being change agents. And uh, that's what some of our conversation will be about, is how do they use themselves and their art, their craft, in order to um, create change, uh, positive change in our communities. So um, welcome to the panelists. We will have about uh, probably 40 minutes of uh, conversation with them, and then we'll open that up uh, if you have questions as well. We have some microphones at the end that you are welcome to ask some questions. So welcome, and thank you all uh, panelists for, for being with us. I will uh, briefly introduce them. Um, and then uh, the first question to them uh, will be uh, allowing them to introduce themselves a little more and share about uh, a project that they're working on. Moving um, from uh, my, uh, my right, um, Juju Papier is a local playwright, playwright and filmmaker who recently developed and directed a one-man show, Wilson Avenue and the Land of No Return, about a young white man's awakening around race and privilege. Welcome. Janelle Renee Dunn, many of us know, is an education associate here at Actors Theater, a teaching artist and founder of Ain't I a Woman Play Fest that is held here in Louisville. Welcome. Shannon Woolley uh, Allison is the founder of Looking for, oh yes, I've jumped uh, to the end, uh, <laughs> the founder of wow. Looking for Lilith Theater Company uh, here in Louisville, many of us know. Song, uh, Songu Jakim, Jakom um, is an actor in the production of Everybody Black, which uh, opened this week. I had a friend that I was talking to last night that went to it and said it was uh, very powerful, so I encourage you to, to see that. And a playwright um, who recently wrote a monologue for the Hands Up plays that showed across the country. Welcome, you all. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
So, um, Juju, we'll just start and, and uh, go down the line. If in, in about two minutes, if you could introduce yourself a little more and then um, share a project that you're working on, um, not necessarily the project that I mentioned, but a project um, which introduce, um, introduces you in the way in which you gauge uh, social change. Um, so, hi everyone, um, I'm Zuzu Papaye, you did really good with Thank that. Thank you. Um, and uh, I am a native Louisvillian, um, practically. I was raised here from elementary school, uh, went to Fern Creek, because uh, everybody asks where, you know, where you went to school, and of course that's high school. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a creaker, or a cricker. Um, then went to UofL, uh, after that, I was, and I was, as I was telling you, um, I was pre-med because my father was Haitian and I had to be a doctor or a lawyer, that's just the way it was. Um, but uh, right before I took the, M the MCAT, I graduated, but I met a woman on a commercial shoot from New York. and. Uh, I was doing commercials for money. I never thought I could make you know, any kind of money acting um, other than uh, just local projects. Um, but I, I got the commercial and at the end of it, she, it was like a Hollywood moment. We shot it at Atherton and there were these trailers and she like goes, come here. And she pulls me out, strong New York accent, pulls me out into this trailer, shoves a card in my hand and says, what are you doing in Louisville? Come to New York, I'll manage your career. So, crazy, you know, fell out of the sky, and uh, I went to New York, and my third audition with an agent who thought I was green and didn't think I was ready, she was freelancing with me, she goes, you know, we're freelance, if you get something, get it, but my third audition was with Sesame Street, and five callbacks later, I'm on Sesame Street, uh, you know, so I was Jamal the park ranger, had a wife and kid on the show, Big Bird's neighbor, um, <laughs> Gordon's cousin, I mean, very weird, uh, but the coolest experience in the world. Um, my father had been an ambassador and was all about Pan-African studies and affecting change. My mom worked for the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights. So there was always something inside me that wanted to do what my family had done, uh, and that was to affect change. Um, so I always found ways to take entertainment and make it uh, edutainment, as we started to call it at that time. Um, that led to directing and writing and producing. And uh, so, as you said, we did a project here recently um, uh, called Wilson Avenue and the Land of No Return. I was talking to a friend, Don Ray Smith, um, who's also a storyteller. And he's a white man in his 70s, or maybe he's just 70. He would be mad at me, so he's just 70. <laughs> and um, he said, uh, yeah, man, he goes, you know, we used to live in the West End. And I went, Rrr. what? No, you didn't, man. He goes, no, white people used to live in the West End. And I said, you've got to tell me this story. And uh, he, tell, he told me this really amazing story about how his family taught him all of these racist values, but he meets this young woman, or he meets a girl in middle school who's black. He's forced to sit by her, doesn't want to sit by her, uh, and falls in love with her. Um, and it changes the way he looks at race. And so anyway, so that's Wilson Avenue and Land of No Return. And lastly, um, I'm working on a TV project about called Angels about uh, two women who take the streets back from pimps who formerly sex trafficked them. And it's really, really cool. So I'm raising funds for that. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Janelle Renee. Um, and I'm originally from South Carolina. Uh, I went to Berea College, which is about two and a half hours south of here. And that is when um, I guess I woke up, as you could say. Um, I fell in love with theater after seeing Phantom of the Opera on Broadway my <laughs> freshman year of high school. I was like, what? You, a chandelier falls from the ceiling. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, but then uh, I had an incident happen at school um, where a play was selected that I, I had, uh, long story short, seniors did the last show, I proposed the Color Museum, they chose the mousetrap, I was like, 
what? Um, and like, what am I supposed to learn from Agatha Christie is really what, what I thought. Um, and it really woke me up to realize like, wait, I'm not, my education is not reflective of who I am. I'm not being taught people who look like me. Um, and so why am I doing theater? And that's really how, um, how I approach theater is I want to do things that reflect people who look like me. Um, I am the education associate here at Actors Theater, and so, uh, hi, Jay. <laughs> um, and so my job is kind of multifaceted. One of the main things that we do is uh, teach playwriting to high school students here in the Kentucky area. Um, and the way that I approach that is that we teach a lot of, to a lot of Title I schools. Um, but we also teach to private schools, we, uh, different types of schools. And so, yes, for the P Title I schools, they're predominantly um, students of color. We can have that conversation later. Um, but it's also important for me to go into the more affluent schools who are predominantly white as a person that looks like me because a lot of times, statistics show that um, students may not engage with a teacher who is of color. So um, that's kind of how I approach my job with um, actors. And then um, I decided to do something crazy and produce a play fest with all women of color playwrights called In I Am Woman. Um, and thank you. Um, it came about because I, I was working with a local company here and it, it folded um, and they were doing uh, 610, um, which is six 10 minute plays by black playwrights. And I was like, this is really cool. We should do an all female version. Well, the company folded and I was like, but this is still a really cool idea. And last year, um, one of our big weekends in education is college days where college students from all over the country come. Uh, it was last weekend, we had like over like 450 college students. And last year I was doing a talk um, about allyship for dummies, right? How can you be an ally? And uh, this black queer college student asked me how does people of color be allies for each other? And I was like, that's a really great question. So I decided that if I'm gonna do, if I'm gonna sit here and talk about being allies, I also have to be an ally. So um, my play fest went from just being all black women to women of color. So that's how, yeah. That's me. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so um, my, to sort of sum everything up, I'm a graduate of Howard University in Washington, DC, HU, that's right. Um, and uh, so I'm kind of cut from the Thurgood Marshall, Amiri Baraka, Kwame Ture, AKA Stokely Carmichael world um, I, to, to walk on the same campus as them is you feel the spirit of why Howard is Howard. Um, and my uh, journey into theater started really in seeing my older brother perform. And then um, at 13, my uh, middle school principal took us to see Malcolm X, Spike Lee's movie. And I was like, oh, oh. And then at 16, my uncles took me to the Million, Million Man March. And I think that was it. I was like, okay, all right, this feels good. It feels good to know what it's like to look at the person next to you and feel free. Because most of the time, you walk in spaces that feel like, mm, this is a little tight. I don't feel fully comfortable. Um, I started writing when myself and my business partner formed a company called The Continuum Project, where we took the African ancestry DNA tests and theater and used it. I created a program to help originally middle school students learn, um, middle school students of African descent learn where they came from before the transatlantic slave trade so that 
they had an understanding that they were not just, we, I live in Brooklyn, New York, so they're not just Brooklyn, but they are Mende of Sierra Leone, they are Bamilake of Cameroon, they are Yoruba of Nigeria, and that that means something, and that if we catch them before they really hit high school and have to form a sense of who they are, a persona, that they can walk into any space and know who they are and that they have a history that precedes um, trauma. And so that also meant that I had to take the journey myself. And um, I started writing, a, I wrote once I found out my ancestry in Cameroon, of the Tikar people in Cameroon. Um, so that then led to a sense of wanting to create work that showed what people of African descent look like when we tap into our Africanness, mm. and how that is an internal healing balm, so that we can also feel empowered enough to move about the world without having to adjust or adapt to fit a particular idea that you have to be a certain way in order to succeed. Um, as vast as African people are on the continent and in the diaspora, we should express that vastness. Um, oftentimes in the theater, that vastness is not expressed. And so writing works like Hands Up, which was um, just after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, um, was me reaching out to New Black Fest, uh, run by Keith Joseph Atkins, and saying, hey man, we, the theater community, have to say something about this. Um, and so he commissioned us to write monologues. Um, and my current piece, When We Left, looks at um, an America where people of African descent are breaking up with the country. And uh, the, the central question is, do our lives actually matter? Or is that some stuff people say to try to keep, you know, to not deal with the reality? Mm. But um, the, the bottom line for the work of um, writing for the now is that historically theater has always been about the now. Mm. Um, Lysistrata is as much about the now when it was written as it is now. <laughs> we look at it as, we call it a classic Greek play, but it wasn't, they weren't sitting there going, what can we make that'll last for time <laughs> memorial? They weren't, you know, Aristophanes and Sophocles and Shakespeare weren't thinking that, they were thinking what's going on right now? And it just so happened that these things still resonate. It's actually kind of crazy that the themes of Alyssa Strada still have to resonate, or the themes of a, of, um, a Lear still have to resonate, or that Hands Up, which was written at the time of Michael Brown's killing, is still being done now because we're still getting killed. So I think that the work is always about the now, um, and that that's actually why we're so necessary um, because somebody's got to say it, and usually the artists are the bravest to say it first. Hi, I'm Shannon. I use uh, she, her pronouns. I am inspired hearing your all stories of like what light lit the path, and it's made me sit here and reflect. Um, so I many years ago when I was getting my BFA at SMU, it, and I don't know what it is now, but it used to be that their incoming class of freshman actors uh, was 15 students, 10 men, and five women. And that was so that all 15 of those students could be guaranteed certain training experiences, um, so that all five of those women in the class of 15, by the time they graduated, would be able to play a certain number of supporting roles, a certain number of leading roles. And it wasn't until I was a junior in college and I said something about it in one of my women and gender studies classes, and my professor was like, don't you think that's strange? Oh. No, I think that's great. I, I'm one of those five women, so that's great. Um, she was like, well, could, couldn't they instead choose a canon of work that would represent more women? Which was mind-blowing to me. Um, <laughs> 
And conversely, one of the best experiences I had working on my BFA was um, a playwriting student at the time, Jenny Jo Power, who's a Vietnamese American woman, invited me to devise a show with her about women's experiences during the Vietnam War, um, both US women and Vietnamese women. And so we interviewed our mothers and our aunts and you know women who had been involved in a number of ways and created this piece, 1968 Vietnam, that was um, the most edifying and nourishing piece of work I'd ever done. And then I graduated and went out with my BFA to be an actor. And, um, played a lot of prostitutes and a lot of ball busters, did a lot of David Mamet. Um, <laughs> and again, and I'm embarrassed to say it, approached it with that sort of unquestioning thing that I did as a freshman at SMU, like this is the work that is here for me to play. And, and literally had a vision in the middle of the night of waking up and remembering working on 1968 Vietnam. and. It just sort of uh, having an internal power spark of if the canon that I want to see produced isn't being produced, I can be a part of producing it or even making it. Um, and so I had this idea, I was maybe 22 at the time, to start a theater company that would be a women's ensemble that would create original productions and programming that would lift up underheard voices. Um, and that was 18 years ago. Luckily, I had some friends, Trina Fisher, uh, Jennifer Tallman Kepler, Kathy E.B. Ellis, who just thought it wasn't a bad idea, and so we did it. So that was about 18 years ago uh, in New York. We moved the company to Louisville in 2006. And our conception of what it means to uplift underheard voices from the perspective of women has changed and grown over 18 years. Um, not in small part due to the fact that our conceptions of gender as an invented social construct have grown. Um, so the perspectives of women is a, is a different idea from moment to moment. And we are constantly continuing to figure out how we uplift our own voices and other voices that are being underheard. Most recently, what that has looked like is um, co-producing with Teatro Tercera Yamada, Louisville Spanish Language Theater, Karen Zacarias, Just Like Us, uh, which is an adaptation of Helen Thorpe's novel about four young women in Denver. It follows them through, from their high school prom through their college graduation. They are all Mexican American women. Two of them are documented and two of them are not. And the play follows how their, that period of their life is impacted by their documentation status. Um, and it was a co first co-production for both of us. The co-producers, Heidi Canovas of Tercera Yamada and my co-artistic director, Kathy Ellis, are back there. I might ask you all to speak on a later question. Um, I feel like that project has been really eye-opening in terms of what authentic collaboration and partnership is, that it is not a situation of if you build it, they will come. You have to have developed partnership and, and true artistic friendship when lifting up an unheard story. Yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. I uh, was able to see uh, Just Like Us last week and uh, echo the, the beauty of the way in which they deal with uh, some really complex issues around immigration, which is fairly timely, huh? Um, to be able to engage that and, and the multiple perspectives that were brought up, uh, I thought you all did that beautifully well. So thank you uh, for those of you that thank were you. part of that. Um, so a little bit of, more about um, the process of, of doing uh, doing your work, um, when you set out or have this vision uh, of what you want to do, um, is, it, is that a, um, are you wanting to specifically address issues? Are you wanting to just express your own voice? Like what are the, what are the motives for doing the work? Um, what, 
Yeah, what are you trying to do? Are you intentionally trying to do that? Are you uh, just trying to express something that uh, you feel? What, talk a little bit about the process of, and the purpose, why, and what you're trying to do in your work. And uh, Shannon, let's start and come back this way, if you don't. I guess I have, I have two thoughts on that. And one is with the historical lens that Looking for Lilith has used in our work. Uh, originally, our work was based on women's history. And that has grown and changed. But I think, I think one of our objectives has always been to bring the present moment to light through looking at something a bit removed. <laughs> And I think about um, many years ago, we created a piece about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. And I was aware in, in post-show programming that people that would not readily want to talk about the labor movement and workers' rights now could become quite passionate when looking at the deaths of these young immigrant women in 1911. And so I think one of the things that we try to do with our work is um, look at how present the past is, as you were speaking to a moment ago. And I think another thing, and I know we're gonna talk some about empathy later, um, but I think we try to tap into the unique magic of theater to replicate personal relationships. We're living in a time right now, and, and have been for generations, but a time right now that is particularly toxic and dangerous and violent and is bred in an atmosphere of homogeny where, um, people are not form familiar with what is outside their own lived experience. And I think that theater does have this unique ability to replicate a, a personal relationship between the spect actors in the dark and the artists that are playing out the story on stage. And we know that building that kind of empathy and feeling I know someone who has had a situation, a circumstance different from my own, it changes something on a cellular level about the way that that person then interacts with the rest of the stimuli in the world. That sounds a little lofty. Um, I'm just gonna deal with the, the etymology of two words, respect and educate. So um, Dr. Joy, Larry DeGruy, who is a psychologist and wrote the book Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, talks about her um, experience in South Africa. And she says one of the main things that people say in South Africa is, I see you. Um, that's where Avatar got it from. <laughs> that's right. Avatar got a lot of stuff from Africa. <laughs> if you don't know that, they just switched blue people out. That's all. <laughs> Just being real. So, um, I see you. The word respect etymologically means to look again. Respect. Um, when you look again, when you look twice at somebody, you have the opportunity to build that relationship and connection because you gotta get past your own original perception to actually understand who a person is, right? The word educate etymologically means to draw out from within, not to indoctrinate mm -hmm. someone with information to then turn them into an automaton of your idea, but to draw out. So in my work, um, how do you draw out respect? How do you, how do you draw out um, understanding of yourself and of other people, and how do people walk out feeling more powerful than when they came in? Mm -hmm. Particularly, how do, how do people who look like me feel more powerful than when they came in? Um, and not like powerful, like, now nah, we're about to go knock some shit out. Not, I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, you might have to, but like, if, if, like, how do you feel like that you can just walk upright with, you know, um, and so some of that is by looking at the power of ritual in theater, which is how, what theater is birthed out of. Some of it is by um, um, 
looking at how our emotions turn on and off. How do we root for people? One of the biggest things I was talking about um, just last night was it seems so interesting that we, we've been working hard in movies to kill off heroes. Heroes, when I was growing up, were the people that had the highest ideal of humanity, and so you rooted for them to win because you then, as a kid, would go and try to be them. And now we'd be like, kill Batman, he's a scrub. Kill Superman, he's a scrub. You know, everybody's getting like killed off. Like, you know, when Black Panther died in Infinity War, I was like, not Black Panther, we just got him. <laughs> <laughs> you can't kill him, you better bring Panther back. Um, so it's like, you know, how do we, but how do we find hope? How do we find our inner power? And how do we help see each other? How do we look again? And um, so that's using, um, sometimes you gotta go a roundabout way, but you still have to say the direct thing. I'm not a playwright who's like, I'm just asking the questions. No, I got something to say to you. Mm -hmm. Because if I just ask the questions, it'll leave you all ambiguous in how you walk out. And that's not how I think change artistically is going to manifest. I'm gonna say something, and I'm gonna go, here's the point I'm making, bow. Now you go out there and, and experiment with the point and see if what I'm saying is valid or not. I don't care whether it's, I mean I do care, but like if you go out and have different experiences, that's fine. But if I'm very clear about what I'm saying as an artist, so that when I say, you know, um, in, a, in a scene, uh, when a character says, I don't know if you really think my life matters or if you're just saying that because that's the right thing to say. Then I need you to, I need the audience to be like, whew, let me take a second. You know, when I have a, um, a Yoruba, a moment of Yoruba ritual in there, first of all, I make sure I research it and fully understand how it works. You don't bring spirit into a place and not know how to deal with that. That's a no-no. But when you, when you work with it, why is the ritual there? To transform. That's why we come to the theater. That's why it's kind of built in a circle. You need the cipher. To, to transform. So I think all of those tools are ways in which you can evoke a positive um, outcome and the way in which I try to be intentional and then leave room for the forces to also do the job that I, I cannot do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At the end of the day, I'm an educator. And one of the things that I always tell students is that your voice matters. Um, and so, that's what I want to bring to the stage, is that the voice matters, our voice matters. As a woman of color, my voice matters, and what I have to say is, uh, it's broad. I have a lot of things to say, and just because um, I am a woman of color doesn't mean that it's just specific to um, my heritage, my culture. I have a lot of things to say. I want to talk about a lot of things. I mean. Like I said before, I like Phantom of the Opera. I want to talk about Phantom of the Opera. I want to do things like Phantom of the Opera. But I also want to talk about um, police brutality. And so in doing Ain't I, that's the point, is to educate. It's to educate audiences to say that women of color, we have lots of things to say and not to pigeonhole us into what you feel we should say as a person of a marginalized group. I mean, um, last year um, we had plays ranging that ranged from uh, talking about um, an undocumented worker who was raped, and actually the playwright for that play is here, um, to about the devil eating Oreos. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, the devil likes Oreos, um, and and so that's so what so the work that I do it's about the voice and honoring the voice and letting it let it letting it be heard, and saying you need to hear what I'm having to say because my voice matters. So <clears throat> this is really hard, and I find myself even as I'm listening and and. Uh, to you all, and as I'm beginning to speak, getting a little emotional. Um, I think that I write and create 
uh, because I'm not brave enough to be an activist. Um, my sister does that. She does it all. But um, it's my way to try to understand the world. Um, you know, uh, we integrated my neighborhood, and from when I was eight years old, when I couldn't go around the block anymore because I was called the N-word by some people, uh, by myself, I couldn't go around the block anymore. My life changed. And from that point, I sought to understand why people who didn't know me could look at me and judge me, and, and judge me in such a negative way. Um, so I fought back by writing. It was the only thing, I think, by the grace of God, that saved me, that kept, kept me sane, was to put down my feelings. First it was poetry, and eventually it became uh, plays, and, and, then, and then screenplays. Um, at this point, I write when events move me. Um, events or, yeah, events. Um, Philando Castile um, shook me. Um, you know, I'm, again, all these years later, uh, I'm an actor, so I won't tell you how many, but <laughs> all these years later, um, after seeing that video of Philando Castile and his girlfriend saying that he had told the cop that he had a license, you know, to carry. But he still shot him. Uh, I was really a wreck. I was in LA and I was driving, and I was driving in Culver City, and I saw these cop cars with their lights on, and I started shaking. And uh, I shouldn't have to feel that. I should not, that, that's not freedom. Um, and from that point, I took my uh, registration from my glove compartment, and I put it right up here. And it's still there. I'm too old to be thinking that way. Um, so I wrote a movie <laughs> uh, called Social Experiment. And it deals with guns and race in America. Um, it's my way to fight. I, and I, I, hum I try to humanize the character so much that and I know it's, I, I shouldn't, again, I, it's probably futile to, to fight it. But I want people to see, in a sense, me through my characters as human. We, we're, we're separated, any of us at most, by three genes according to the human genome, right? Of 20,000 plus genes. One is for deep, one codes for deep pigmentation, another codes for blonde hair, another codes for blue eyes. Otherwise, we all came from the same place and there were mixtures and there were mutations and that's why we're here. Yet people still judge people because of this. And I've, I've had it all. New York City in an elevator dressed in a suit and a woman grabs her purse. And I'm like, come on, are you serious? And you get mad. I don't know how to explain if, if you haven't experienced that what that's like. Um, so anyway, that, that is my way to, to fight by, uh, by putting it on paper and, um, and hopefully making these people so human that some people uh, start to see people of color differently. So that's it. So I want to <clears throat> stay with um, and give you all a chance um, we talk about creating theater in the moment. Well, why don't uh, let's kind of be present to what um, what's going on with what's arising in us right now with things that you all have, have shared, and invite the audience to do that. Well, just also check in with what what's being evoked with us, and um, give you the opportunity to um, anybody to share what's what's showing up for you as each other speaks. Um, what wants to be said in the moment um, about what's here and present. And we can sit with some of that as well, just in silence. You know what makes Juju? You Haitian, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Haiti, for some 
really jacked up reason is paying a large price for what Tucson did. Um, so, like, first of all, art and what you're doing, like, you are fighting, mm -hmm. first and foremost. <laughs> Everybody who's in a war is not on the front lines. Mm -hmm. It's the lieutenants and the generals and the admirals who sit and create the battle plans and the vision. What, what was one of the biggest things about the Iraq war is that they went in to liberate Iraq and had no game plan for what to do afterwards, right? Um, vision and having it, because we're not, we don't just, we're not creating just because we have a particular emotion that has to come out. We're also painting a picture by which to look at what we could become. Mm -hmm. the, one of the reasons I was talking about this with you earlier about Christmas Carol. Now, I done had a gazillion conversations about theaters doing Christmas Carol over and over and over again. I'd be like, oh, not Christmas Carol again. <laughs> They don't do the Grinch, they don't do Charlie Brown Christmas, it's just Christmas Carol. You know what I mean? Right. Now here's an interesting thing about Christmas Carol. That is a very political story. Charles Dickens is saying, look, at a time when the whole, the whole reason for Christmas is a child was born next to animals because higher authority was set out to kill him for what he could do to liberate other people. Time out for a second. Scrooge is a dude who has hoarded money because of his life and he made the decision to, and spirits had to show up to scare him. <laughs> Spirits had to show up. They showed him when he was happy and how he turned to be a miser. Then they showed all his friends being happy. And then death showed up and was like, if you don't change, we're going to kill you. And he was like, my bad. Hey, here's some money, y'all. I'm so sorry. Right? How is it? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but yet, we go and we're like, oh, yes, it's the holidays. Let's go see Scrooge. And nobody goes out and is more giving after they go see A Christmas Carol. So what happened to Dickens' message? How, how are we not thinking to be more generous? Like, we'll be like, oh, yeah, look, he was giving money to the guy, blind man with the dog, and then you walk right past the homeless cat outside. <laughs> so did it work? Did it work? Um, that philando thing upset me too. But so did Amadou Diallo and Abner Louima and Anthony Baez and Sandra Bland, like, mm -hmm. and, and Rodney King and Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The question is what does this country look like devoid of sexism, of racism, of discrimination? If we cannot imagine that and see what that looks like and see that it doesn't look homogenous, it's not like we're all talking and walking the same and wearing the same stuff, it's that like you're healed and you don't walk in a place concerned about your safety. Case in point, I came down to Louisville, my friends was like, you going to Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky? Are you sure? They was like, yo, if somebody offers you tea and starts stirring the cup, don't stay. <laughs> straight up, straight up, you know what I mean? Like, because we've had to, we know what that, that walk is like. So I think one thing that we can do to help change things, all of us, what is a vision of who we can become? Can you paint that? People of color, marginalized peoples, can you paint that artistically and show it? Would you, non-artists, come to the theater to see that picture? 
Or are you more comfortable with the pictures that are currently affirming how you like to see stuff? If you're more comfortable with that, if that's what you put your money towards, if you don't want to see the new works that are manifesting, see the new collaborations, if you got a problem hearing a play in Arabic or in Spanish or in Creole or, uh, or a play about the Gullah Geechee community, if, if that is something that you're like, I don't want to see that, stop for a minute and think about why you don't want to see that and why you still are showing up to watch Christmas Carol to feel placated. Think about that. Shannon, Janelle, either of y'all, what's showing up for you all? What's showing up for me is a need to listen. Mm -hmm. So I, that's all mm -hmm. I'm going to say. Any other responses from the panel, to the panel, or what's showing up? Now, okay, time to, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, what's showing up for you? And if, uh, when you get the microphone, if you wouldn't mind uh, saying your name, and um, yeah, share uh, also what's, sh what's showing up for you so we can kind of harvest what's going on in our, our collective experience. So. Hi, I'm Gabriela. Gabriela. Um, I like to say my name in Spanish. Um, I'm a, in a play here, How to Defend Yourself. Thank you all. I'm so, my brain is just going. Mm. Um, I feel called to share that I am Dominican, and I'm, I'm from the island. I grew up in the island, and it's interesting to be a, something that's almost like a myth, but it's like a, I'm a brown person with privilege, which is like, what is that? Um, and it's funny, because when I came to this country about five years ago, I, I never saw myself as, a, as an other until that point, because this is OK. We're in, in the island. And, and then I'm like, wow, we're doing to Haiti. And, and, and the relationship between Haitians and Dominicans is exactly the same of what's happening with the wall. <laughs> and, 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 and it's funny, right? Because I, I feel this. I, I keep hearing, like, as a person of color, you're not supposed to be a teacher. Like, that's not your responsibility. Like, it's exhausting and all these things. But as an immigrant with privilege, I feel so called to be like, no, this is like a global issue. And, and, and so I, I struggle with that, right? Because I've, I've, I've worn the skin of, like, um, I, I'm in this country now, the issues happening in this country pertain to me, but I was so checked out back where I'm from. And so it's like, how do I, how do I become a middleman in a way? And so, and I was very inspired by hearing how, y yes, our, our, like our, our work has this weight now. That it's, it's always had it, like we're making work for, for the, the, the moment. But it's also what happens after the play. And so one of the most riveting experiences I've had here in Louisville has been doing the share days with that Janelle like, helps facilitate. Thank you so much for that. It's, it's going to high schools and reading uh, plays that the young writers have written to be considered for the new voices. Um, and so um, I feel something in me is like, oh, we got to start there. And so. Long story short, I'm curious to hearing how do we, how do we help that like global mindset to be inflicted in our schools, in our work, to have both like young, because I think the youth is a big part of what's going to move the gender, like the times to come. So I'm wondering, because I saw, one of the things that really moved me was seeing this like mixed girl writing about a play in the hol set in the Holocaust. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about, like, should this person be writing about this? And this is like a kid that's like, what, 15 or something? And I'm like, why do I feel so conflicted about this? And I'm like, oh, but I do want people to know about these things. Like, we want everyone to know the history of everything ever. Like, I grew up learning American history, Dominican history, European, everything. So I'm like, how do we? How do we 
allow our, 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 our youth to both be well-rounded and know about everything, yet still make spaces for the people of certain races, of certain experiences, raise their voice. Like, how, I don't know, how do we approach that? Because I'm very interested in that education side of it. So I'm, I'm yeah, yes. Any, anybody want to pick that? Oh, uh, so or pieces of uh, it? I'll take a part of it. Um, I um, have also been able to teach in public schools. And uh, one of the things that is tough um, is that sometimes there's a miseducation. Um, there, oh, simply, um, more of the truth needs to be shared. That's, that, it, that has to happen first, right? Um, people need to know, you know, that uh, there were, that, that, that Africans, for instance, weren't uh, just enslaved, you know, that, that they were king, that they were kings as well. Uh, Timbuktu, and you know, there, there were, you know, there were all of these wonderful um, um, communities that were developed that were even ahead of Europe at times, um, and that Egypt, uh, you know, has uh, been colonized over and over again, and that those people who built the pyramids look, were darker than me. Like that's the type of stuff that has to be shared too. Otherwise, you grow up, even I'm only discovering some of these things uh, more recently, you grow up, there's a part of you that even if you have great parents, that feels inferior. And that's by design, but, but, but we need to know more about the truth of people's contributions uh, around the world, but, but in America too, right? I think, anyway, I think that's a part of it. I, I would really like to see the educational and pedagogical work of established arts institutions be um, more integral and level with their production work. Um, I, something that we have said at Lilith for a while is that we try to be a bird with two wings and one wing is our main stage productions and the other wing is all of the applied theater work that we do and the wings have to remain equal strength or we're just going to fly in a circle and I see a lot of arts institutions in Louisville and nationally flying in a circle um, and making public work that exists in a vacuum and is not entering any kind of community realm. So I, I would like to see more birds flying straight. I th for me, as a person of color, I have to be a teacher. And, but it's also defining what you mean by being a teacher. Like, it's not for me to educate some random person all the time. Like, it's not, from, it's not meant for me to be like, oh, check your whiteness every single day, because that's exhausting, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, oh, check your sexism as a woman exhausting not however in a classroom setting anytime you can be a teacher i advocate for more people of color to be teachers because that's one of the ways that we can change the next generation um you know at the top i said that i like going into a lot of our predominantly white schools that we teach at because i go in with my head wraps and um, one that, you know, and just this culture aesthetic that's like, yeah, we're gonna do some plays. Yeah, your voice matters, let's do this. Um, one of the days that we talk, we talk about character and I love talking about character because we talk about archetypes and stereotypes. And so it's a very interesting conversation when we get to stereotypes. And so a lot of times I'll bring up the angry black woman. Like, yes, I'm black. Yes, sometimes I get angry, but it's not a stereotype. And I have the right to be angry when I want to. And just because I'm black, it doesn't dictate my anger. Um, so it's, it's gonna, it takes more teachers. It's in it, just how we talk about representation matters on stage. Representation matters in the classroom. Um, 
because as Dominican, you're coming from a place that's different. Like you have a vast knowledge that I don't have that I can't teach um, or share. I can, I can, yes, I can Google, I can do the research, but you would have a completely different perspective um, that a student would gain knowledge from. So I say go into the classroom, be present, if, uh, mentor um, students, yeah. Got one right here. So um, we're gonna, let's, uh, uh, one more, uh, and we're gonna get close with uh, th this question. One of the, um, one of the challenges that we have a lot of uh, times once we wake up to some of these realities of discrimination or uh, voices that haven't been heard, we often don't know what to do. And so uh, a question like out of your work, like if you hope somebody participates and um, experiences your work, what is something you would say, I, out of this, I want you to do this. Like this is what you can practically do to honor that you've had this experience. You know, like what would be the thing you would tell us? I want you to do this because this is this is why I am doing this work. What can we change? And so, let's just go down the line, this and you can jumps name out that. at me. Yeah, um, I would say, look in the mirror. Look at your culture. Fix your culture, your community first. Stop pointing at other co communities. Hire more women of color. <laughs> Drop that mic. Son. Drop that mic. <laughs> uh, I think um, first and foremost, um, the the look in the mirror is essential, so that you definitely can hire, um, because a lot of this conversation actually isn't just about discrimination; it's a power. Dynamic. That's why people talk about the difference between equality and equity. So that you understand there's a difference in that. So that you're not just putting, it's not just us on stage or in a film, but who's running the theater? Robert Barry Fleming. Um, <laughs> and will the board be open to your vision as you extend to playwrights that we don't typically see year after year after year after year being in your work? Will the education department be as visible and valuable as the main stage productions in the Bingham or the Pam Brown? Um, I think what we can do um, is start making sure that we are watching different TV that doesn't always look like us, listening to different music that doesn't always sound like us, reading different books that aren't about the subjects that we always are exposed to, and recognizing that what is on your plate is not what is in the buffet. <laughs> and, and then make a conscious, now here's the thing, I'm gonna leave with one warning. Just being nice doesn't do it. Yeah. Don't just come up. I, I know y'all from the South. I appreciate your Southern hospitality because cats in New York ain't like that. But don't just think that you came up and said hi and, and talked to me that I'm, I'm going to just magically trust you. I got 500 years of mistrust running through me. That's a lot to get over. So we can start off, like, we can be cool, but understand that I have an antenna up 24 seven, because I'm just like, all I'm waiting is for that one thing that, uh, don't, please don't say you people, please don't say you people. Please don't like stumble over your words when you're trying to figure out what title to use for my group of people. You know, like, don't, don't be that one. And then make sure that when you are hearing something in the spaces that you're in that I'm not in, that you say something in the moment. And people of color, marginalized peoples as a whole, if somebody says or does something in the moment that offends you, say something about it in the moment. Don't worry about, oh my job, oh my, you know what I mean? Like, don't be that. Like, if we speak to it in the now, that's what this whole thing is about, we can deal with it in the now so that we can build that future.
And I think if we do the now, we don't, you don't have to worry about the promise of tomorrow. Thank you. All right, I, before I say this, I'm gonna say this is me speaking as Shannon and not as a representative of looking for Lilith. It may be everybody in Lilith feels the same way, but just this is Shannon. I hope that you will look in the mirror and then you will look at the ballot and I hope that, uh, I hope that you will vote differently. Uh, and I'm gonna get very real and, and very local. I hope that if you live in a district of Louisville that doesn't want to pay $12 more to fund our, $12 more a month to fund the basic services of our city, that you will look at your ballot and, and vote differently. Mm. So uh, let's give all of our panelists a, a round of applause. We want to uh, thank Actors Theatre for hosting these. Zach, thank you for putting this together and for your vision of the Humana Festival, which is uplifting really beautiful uh, voices uh, that have often not been heard. So thank you all for your participation. I'm sure our artists will be here if you want to uh, come and say some other words to them. And um, one of the things with Lean Into Louisville, we're trying to create spaces to have these hard conversations. So um, uh, create spaces in your own life uh, in your community and your organizations for us to have have these conversations that that's one of the ways forward and then uh, let us act on what's showing up take action and not just uh, uh, just read an article that said uh, let them eat harmony which uh, was a response to we're just tired of talking let's uh, let's change some of the things that we know need to change and not just sit around and uh, and talk so uh, have good conversations and take actions and we can create the kind of community that the visions of this work uh, are pointing to. Thank you for being here.